Warning. Excessive use of this product may lead to broken left mouse buttons, lowered inhibitions, excessive bravado, leading to dumb strats like blowing up a bulk on an omen tower. Please use responsibly. I don't really need an actual introduction to this gun, do I? It's that one. You know, that one. The one that spins. That's the spice. Miniguns and games are often designed to encourage you to keep shooting for long amounts of time. There's multiple of these mechanics attached to the minigun in Deep Rock. The first of these is, when you press M1, there's a short spin-up time of 0.7 seconds until the gun actually starts shooting. When not shooting, your gun spins down, at a slower rate than it spins up, taking 2 seconds to spin down fully. So, if you stop shooting for 1 second, your gun will be halfway spun down, and it will take half the normal time to spin back up again. Since you don't want to wait through more delay than you need to, this encourages continuing to shoot once you start, or at least, not taking long breaks in shooting. The second of these is a deep ammo pool, and the third is the unusual reversed spread. The base spread of the minigun is only 4.5. That's not very much. However, on top of this we have 25 added bloom, giving us a total spread of 29.5 and this huge reticle as a result. Since it's reversed, the bloom is reduced when you shoot instead of increasing. Internally, what's happening here is, you have a spread value that ranges from 0 to 3.5. The higher it is, the lower the minigun's bloom. I'm going to call this value X from now on, because calling something that reduces spread, spread, is confusing. Every shot you fire increases X by 0 0.2, and every second it decays by 1, whether or not you're shooting. Once it's at 3 or higher, the bloom has been reduced to 0. I'm sure a lot of you know that the minigun's ammo and rate of fire numbers are doubled. It actually fires 15 shots per second, not 30, consuming 2 ammo for every 1 shot. So, you add 0.2 to X 15 times per second, but you also lose 1x per second at the same time due to decay, resulting in a total of plus 2x per second. When x reaches 3, you're fully stabilized. As a result of this, it takes 1.5 seconds of firing and 22 shots, which cost 44 ammo, to reach max stability. If you equip Tier 1B, it takes 1.25 seconds to get there, and only 21 shots because the decay has less time to act. If you have compact feed mechanism equipped without Tier 1B to raise the fire rate back up to normal, the opposite happens. It now takes 1.875 seconds and 24 shots to reach max stability. Reaching maximum stability faster is not just about accuracy, of course. The first of the Tier 4 mods gives you plus 15% damage per shot if you are fully stabilized. So, if you can get there faster, you can spend more time in a fight with that damage bonus. Now, you might know that after you stop firing, it takes 0.5 seconds for the bloom to start growing again. But you don't actually always have this buffer. If we look at that graph again, we can see that X keeps increasing for a bit, even after the bloom has already been reduced down to zero. Basically, if you keep shooting after reaching max accuracy, you get to bank some stability for later. If that all seems kind of confusing, don't worry. For me to understand it, it needed to be explained to me by Meat Shield. And for Meat Shield to understand it, it needed to be explained to him by this guy, Senior Game Designer for Ghost Ship Games. It's not intuitive, to say the least. If you equip Tier 4C, Magnetic Bearings, the maximum X can reach is increased by 0.75, allowing you to bank up to 1.25 seconds of post-shooting stability. It also makes the gun spin down slower, 
taking 3 seconds to spin all the way down from full instead of 2. Neither of those are huge benefits, but it does mean the gun becomes a bit more flexible in use once you've spent that first 0.7 seconds revving up. With this, it'll take longer to spin down again, and shooting in bursts may be more accurate. Of course, Tier 4B shaves 0.4 seconds off that initial spin-up. Although it doesn't extend stability after you stop shooting, it does let you be more reactive from the start, and combats spin-down in a way that feels pretty similar in practice to magnetic bearings. Whether you're spinning up faster or spinning down slower, either way you're dealing with less delay between bursts. Despite the fact that one of the tier 4 mods lets you do more damage, which of these three is the best is extremely subjective. There's no real winner here, so beyond saying that there is some synergy between the rate of fire mod and chamber pressure, I can't really strongly recommend anything here. I personally use the second option a lot, but just use whatever you're comfortable with on this tier. While I'm thinking about rate of fire, it is actually possible to fire a lot faster than the minigun's normal rate of fire, by clicking extremely fast. You need a third party program running a macro to do that of course, you can't click that fast as a real human being. Obviously, actually doing this is pretty clearly cheating. It could be argued that the minigun shouldn't be coded in a way where this is possible, but realistically if someone is willing to run a macro to cheat, they could just as easily load up Cheat Engine, so it doesn't really matter. Next we have Heat. A minigun is one of a few weapons that does not have to reload, instead recovering from shooting over time when you aren't firing it. The minigun gains heat at a rate of 1 per second, and overheats at 9.5 heat. So you can fire for slightly less than 9.5 seconds without overheating. Rate of fire has no impact on this. So if you have a higher rate of fire, you get to put out more shots before overheating. There's a delay of 0.3 seconds before the minigun starts cooling at a rate of 1.5 per second. So cooling down from almost full takes a little over 6.5 seconds. If you take the tier 1 cooling mod, the delay before cooling is cut in half and the rate of cooling is doubled, so now you take 3.31 seconds to cool from nearly full. All of the tier 5 mods interact with overheating in some way. Aggressive venting inflicts 60 heat and 10 fear in a 10 meter radius when you overheat. However, it does fall off based on range, doing the maximum within 6 meters and falling down to a minimum of 25%. In addition to the main effect, aggressive venting does also inflict a flat 6 fire damage and heat across the whole radius with no fall off. At the edge of the radius you won't ignite grunts. 9 meters or closer you will, but death is not guaranteed without heat spreading until grunts are only 7 meters away. Also, it cuts overheat time in half, from 10 seconds to 5 seconds. This means that if you are very close to overheating, it can actually be a bit faster to overheat than cooling down normally, albeit not by a lot and less flexibly. Cold as the Grave reduces heat by 0.6 every time your minigun bullets kill an enemy, which means another 0.6 seconds of firing before overheat. Against squishy enemies, this basically means you're not realistically going to overheat, and swarmers are free liquid cooling. It has very little value against tanky enemies, but you might be using your secondary on those anyways. Hot bullets is the simplest of the three. When you're at over 50% heat, your bullets light on fire and inflict heat equal to 50% of their damage stat. Your direct damage doesn't go up, but you'll still do more damage total, so if you're not having issues with the base gun's heating, this is a good pick.
The last mechanic to cover is movement. The minigun, like all gunner primaries, cuts your move speed in half when firing. For reference, a normal player walk speed is 300, and sprint speed is 435. So your walk speed goes down to 150 when shooting this. But these penalties only apply to ground speed. If you shoot while jumping, you can maintain normal move speed, or even sprinting speed. As long as you don't fire when your feet touch the ground, your movement in the air is totally unaffected. Your sprint won't even get cancelled, and if you mess up and it does get cancelled, you can just press shift when you touch the ground to start sprinting again. This even applies to Lead Storm, which normally reduces your move speed all the way to zero when shooting. If you keep hopping around, you can keep your normal move speed to kite enemies with while also shooting in bursts, which is useful to learn for all of Gunner's primaries, but especially this minigun overclock. So, that's all the mechanics of this gun. What about mod choices? Let's assume no overclocks first. Tier 1 cooling isn't very worth it usually, because the other tier 1 mods are quite strong, and both Cold as the Grave and Aggressive Venting can help manage heat instead. As we've covered already, higher rate of fire means the minigun stabilizes faster, but does not mean it overheats faster. So, should you take this rate of fire mod? Well, the answer is still just maybe. It's not a huge rate of fire boost, and the accuracy mod it's competing with is strong, reducing minigun's base spread from 4.5 to 1.125. The base spread isn't exactly bad, but you do get to hit weak points more frequently with better accuracy. And the minigun is quite good at shooting weak points. The enemies and mission type you're going against matter for this choice. If you wind up in big caves or fighting a lot of Mactera or Menaces, for instance, you'll benefit more from accuracy. But if you're doing a lot of fighting in close quarters or against bugs with poor weak points, you can get more value from rate of fire. You don't always know which sort of mission you'll be in, of course, but broadly speaking, I'd say accuracy is better for longer missions that tend to generate large cave structures. Mactera Plague. and Rival Threat. On the other hand, Rate of Fire is usually better in short missions that tend to generate small caves, elimination, and point extraction. Second tier is a simple ammo versus damage choice, but not a particularly balanced one. Taking the damage up raises your total damage by almost as much as taking the ammo up. 14,400 total raw damage versus 15,000. And despite barely losing any total damage, you're doing 20% more DPS. Now, total damage and DPS don't tell you the whole story. For instance, higher DPS might not actually matter much if your time to kill versus specific enemies didn't actually change. This happens to the M1K. Against most common enemies, it doesn't actually kill them any faster by taking the damage up. But that does not happen to the minigun. Whether you're hitting grunts in the body or the weak point, this damage up kills them in fewer shots. Which isn't really a surprise, since it's a low damage, high rate of fire gun. As a result, the impression that the raw damage and DPS gives bears out here. Long story short, you should normally take the damage mod on minigun, the only exceptions being based on overclocks. Tier 3 is not quite as clear-cut, but it's not usually a very hard choice either. You have a mod that doubles stun chance and increases stun time by 2 seconds, a 200% armor break mod, which is not bugged in case you were wondering, and blow through. I think most people already share this opinion, but typically blow through has the most value here. You won't always be hitting two enemies, but when you are, it's extremely valuable. 
extra chance to stun bugs isn't really that competitive, and armor break isn't super powerful on this gun even if you're totally focused on single target damage. Sometimes zip gunning enthusiasts take armor break, but if I can talk class strategy here for a moment, I don't really recommend zip gunning in general. If you have decent game sense, you can keep yourself safe from ranged enemies without too much trouble, but the upside of keeping yourself free from melee enemies isn't really worth it. Whenever you do this, you're usually forcing your teammates to take all the melee bug aggro, which isn't great, especially because you're Gunner, and you are really good at dealing with the bug's aggro. If anything, as Gunner, you want bugs to be swarming you more than your teammates, not less. You can handle it really well, and enemies bunching up near you makes your blow-through and AoE options work better. The effectiveness of blow-through does vary based on terrain. It's best when Gunner can get into a cramped space with a lot of guys in a line that he can blow through. But even in larger spaces, you'll still usually be able to line bugs up. Tier 4, as I've said, is very subjective. Chamber pressure does meet some minor breakpoints, such as one-shotting swarmers with the lead storm overclock, but are you really going to be tagging swarmers with exactly one bullet while fully revved up? Probably not. You will kill tanky enemies like Praetorians a bit faster, but you have to weigh that against the increased flexibility the other options give you. Tier 5 is usually subjective as well, but on a typical build I would recommend cold as the grave or hot bullets more than aggressive venting. Aggressive venting suffers from a use case issue. The way that you activate it is with a lot of uninterrupted minigun fire, and the effect is AoE heat surrounding you. The problem is, after a lot of uninterrupted minigun fire, there's not likely to be a lot of bugs near you to set on fire, especially if your teammates are also helping out. You can take it for the faster overheat, but with how long it takes to reach that overheat in the first place, it's still kind of clunky. So in the end, things kind of look like this. All that said, what's the minigun's role? Well, Gunner in general is more of a defensive class than the other dwarves, and while the minigun doesn't burst down targets extremely fast, it has great uptime, which can help keep you and your team safe. The ratio of time you can spend shooting versus not shooting is really good, and it can deal with targets at basically any range. So, you can keep on mulching bugs as they appear without ever really getting caught out reloading. Constant bug suppression, so long as you're aware of what's going on. Gunner's other primaries also have good uptime, but not quite as good, and even with Born Ready, they at least need to switch to a different weapon for a bit, which might not be ideal. While Autocannon has good AoE, the bad accuracy limits how it can engage targets. The Hurricane has both accuracy and AoE, but it has worse single target damage and terrain or long range can make the travel time of the missiles cumbersome. Running a Swarm Clear Focus Secondary along Minigun is common, but not truly needed. While it's not the best in the game at killing squishy groups, you can get by with Minigun and a single target secondary. And if you really think about it, killing one target after another quickly enough is basically AoE. After all, a Swarm is just a bunch of single targets one after another, right? As for overclocks, minigun OCs essentially fall into two categories, basic and gimmicky, which each have one clear winner. On the basic side, you have thinned drum walls, which gives a bit more ammo and cooling rate. It's fine. A little more oomph, which gives slightly more damage and slightly less spin-up time. It's fine. Compact feed mechanism, which gives a lot more ammo, but cuts rate of fire somewhat. It's fine. 
then Exhaust Vectoring, which gives plus 2 damage and multiplies spread by 2.5. Now we're getting somewhere. This is a pretty noticeable damage boost, and it does make the ammo up a somewhat better choice. Although usually still worse than damage. But we can do better. Lead Storm is basically the king of non-gimmicky minigun overclocks. A whopping plus 4 damage, which is either plus 40% or plus 33% damage based on your tier 2 choice. This is making the ammo mod a bit more tempting still, though frankly you probably won't need it. In fact, if you take damage with this, you have the exact same total damage as Compact Feed Mechanism with damage up. Except, you do more damage per shot, and you don't have to spend your tier 1 mod just to get back to the normal rate of fire. The first downside of Lead Storm is that it lowers move speed by 100% on the ground when firing, instead of 50%. As I mentioned earlier, you can hop around to preserve your move speed, so this downside is far more lenient than it first appears. The second downside is a worse stun, one-fourth the normal stun chance and half the normal stun duration. That's a bit more meaningful, but it usually doesn't matter when the enemies you're shooting die so quickly. I don't mean to say that the downsides mean nothing. While you can greatly mitigate the movement penalty, it still limits you a bit, and the worst stun does sometimes matter. But not a lot. Though it's a little confusing, it's also kind of fitting that this has the same name as the minigun itself. If you want a straightforward minigun that does minigun things, this overclock is going to be the best at it, and it's going to reward you the most for your aim, positioning, and movement. Now it's time for the gimmicky overclocks. Of hell. Okay, okay, let's be fair here. Bullet Hell reduces damage by 3 and multiplies base spread by 6. In exchange, it gives you a 75% chance for bullets to ricochet towards an enemy within 6 meters on hitting either terrain or an enemy. While Armor Break can help the ricochets do damage, usually if you're firing into a group of bugs, you still do a bit more with Blow Through. Although Armor Break is a little more consistent and can work better with more spaced out bugs. I already covered how Ricochet and Blowthrough interact in the Bulldog video, so if you want to see that in depth, go there. To sum it up, Ricochet bullets roll for Ricochet once, and if it's successful, they ricochet once off the first thing they hit. If a bullet ricochets and blows through a target, it gets split into two bullets. Both the Ricochet path and the Blowthrough path do damage, but the Blowthrough path is invisible. Simply put, Bullet Hell with Blowthrough shooting into a group can do 9 damage to two targets, and then a 75% chance to do 9 damage again, for a total of 27 damage. On average, 24.75 damage. Which is, under pretty ideal circumstances, slightly more damage than a no overclock minigun can do with Blowthrough. If we take Armor Break instead, we're doing 9 damage twice, so it's like a more consistent, but also considerably weaker blowthrough. But neither of these is showing the full picture. Like, okay, here's an example. Let's say the player is shooting at a group of clustered bugs, and shoots a grunt in the weak point for 2x damage. Then let's say the blowthrough has a 50% chance of hitting the next grunt in the weak point, and a 50% chance of hitting armor. So, under this model, a normal minigun shot looks like this. Now let's say you're using bullet hell, so you have lower damage. Since ricochets aim at a random enemy's center, they rarely hit weak points. Let's say the ricochet has a 25% chance to hit a weak point, which is honestly pretty generous. Now the model looks like this. What if you equip Armor Break instead of Blowthrough? Leads to a more simple equation, at least. And here are the results if the context is the same, but the Blowthrough doesn't hit anything. 
In this case, bullet health pulls ahead, especially with armor break, but not by much. Now, with these two sets of data, we can easily get an average if we assume there is a 50% chance of the blow-through shot hitting versus missing a second bug, or a 75% chance of the blow-through shot hitting a second bug. Now, that's all very abstracted. It's both leaving out some of the advantage of bullet hell in that, in real situations where sometimes you miss, you can still get some value from ricochets. But it's also leaving out some of the disadvantage of bullet hell in the accuracy that is significantly worse than base even with the accuracy mod, meaning your initial shot hits weak points less often. We could sit here for hours trying to muddle out a more accurate model, but on paper math will never be truly accurate for these things. The main reason I went through all that is just to get across how it's not nearly as simple as lose some damage but your bullets hit an extra target. If it was that simple, bullet hell would be a lot better. So let's stop talking theoreticals and just do some basic testing. If you're in an open space, which limits the effectiveness of blow through compared to ricochets, and a wave of grunts runs at you, what works better for killing them? Base minigun, bullet hell blow through, or bullet hell armor break? Well, comparing bullet hell builds, blow through wins out over armor break, but not by much. Hot bullets can improve ammo efficiency for both, but waiting for the fire damage over time means that kill times will usually be a bit slower. When we compare to a no overclocks minigun, the result is pretty ambiguous. Sometimes bullet hell wins, but when it does, it's only fairly. and sometimes it outright loses to a no overclocks minigun. Considering what you give up by equipping bullet hell, you'd really want it to be decisively better in this context. Anytime you're shooting tankier or solo targets, or anytime you're in a less open space, it'll fall farther behind. Bullet hell is clearly better against stuff like swarmers, but so are gunners' other primaries. So honestly, we ought to take a quick look at those. This is even more clear-cut. Not only are both these guns better at killing groups than bullet hell, they're also still better at single target damage. And again, this is without overclocks on both autocannon and hurricane. You can also use a build like this to try and stun bugs until you overheat and burn them all. I really don't recommend this though. It's not especially strong even at the best of times, but DRG is a team game, and your teammates are going to be killing stuff. Trying to do this will mostly just result in you wasting a bunch of ammo, because your teammates are flattening the bugs long before you can successfully overheat and burn them. Pretty much turns your minigun into a worse version of the AoE primaries, at the cost of your overclock slog. I rate bullet hell 4 funny ducks out of 5 on the fun scale, and one and a half pedantic nerds out of five on the usefulness scale. Now we're finally here, my favorite. The video's gotten quite long, so I'll try to keep this brief. Burning Hell makes your minigun heat up 50% faster. In exchange, it deals five fire damage and 20 heat, four times per second in a five meter cone-shaped AOE in front of you. So once every 0.25 seconds. 
but it doesn't have to wait out that 0.25 second tick rate to do damage the first time. As soon as you start shooting, when the first bullet leaves the gun, you immediately deal the AoE damage once. This is kind of like how, when you apply a damage over time status effect like Neurotoxin or Fire, it instantly ticks damage once without having to wait for the tick rate. You get one free tick of damage at the start, so the DPS is a little higher at the beginning of the effect. And this means you can clear swarmers not just quickly, but incredibly ammo efficiently as well, killing all swarmers within 5 meters in front of you for just one minigun shot. Because of that, this is my actual favorite minigun overclock for Swarmageddon. Bullet Hell can clear them farther away, but it costs a lot more ammo, and Burning Hell still gets to do minigun things because it doesn't lose accuracy and damage. That first free tick also makes shooting in bursts a little better, which is convenient because of that plus 50% heat gain downside. But of course, gaining heat 50% faster means you reach both hot bullets and aggressive venting 50% faster. Now, I am a certified aggressive venting hater, but obviously, if you can reach the vent in 6.33 seconds instead of 9.5 seconds, it's a lot better. You do still lose some sustained volume of fire with this, and the close range nature of it means that not everyone will find it comfortable with their playstyle, but giving the minigun this sort of AoE benefit without compromising damage is very powerful, and of course it's great for comboing with volatile bullets on the bulldog. It also has the best build diversity of any minigun overclock. In Tier 1, faster cooling is now quite nice, especially with hot bullets, but the other choices are still pretty good too. In Tier 2, ammo is finally actually truly competitive, because the AoE effect doesn't scale off of damage. But since the overclock is quite ammo efficient, taking damage instead is still a fine choice. Because you have built-in AoE, blow-through becomes a bit less important, so you can more easily justify armor break to set up volatile bullet shots more easily, or stun to make kiting burning bugs in close quarters safer. Tier 4 leans a bit more towards B and C, but damage is still damage. And in Tier 5, hot bullets and aggressive venting are both good. The only mod I'd say is bad on this is Cold is the Grave, because enemies dying to the fire effect don't activate it. And even when it does activate, due to the faster overheating, it's only giving 0.4 more seconds of shooting before overheat, instead of the normal 0.6. And that's all, folks. This took a long time to put together, so I hope you've learned something about the funny spinning gun. <laughs>